And now receive these words from Genesis. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God, show us the way. Remind us who we are and whose we are. And may the words of my mouth this day and the meditations and reflections of all of our hearts be pleasing and glorifying to you, our God, our maker, our redeemer, our friend. Amen. A cease and desist letter is a document sent to an individual or business to stop, cease, alleged illegal activity, and not to restart it, desist. The letter may warn that if the recipient does not discontinue specified conduct or take certain actions by deadlines set in the letter, that party may be sued. Cease and desist letters are sometimes used to intimidate recipients and can be an effective tool used by corporations to chill the critical speech of people. I don't think anyone ever wants to receive a cease and desist document. It is my growing conviction, however, that we have received such a document, and the document isn't going away anytime soon because it's a living document. It's a God-breathed document. Its purpose, not for intimidation, but a reminder, nonetheless, that we need to chill because a lot of what we're doing could be considered illegal within the parameters God has created. And this living document comes to us in the form of the foundational concept established in the very beginning, Sabbath. For many Christians, Sabbath may be a familiar concept, though perhaps not really practiced anymore. It may be an ancient relic, outdated, irrelevant. The word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shavat, which means... You guessed it, cease and desist. In everyday language, this simply means to stop. Stop working. Stop creating. Stop doing. Stop fretting. Just stop. Simply stop. Now, the definition of any work of work is any activity that changes one's environment. And the Sabbath is a way of giving up trying to change things. Anyone here like to change things? Everyone should be raising their hands. We first learn of Sabbath from the story of creation, which we just read a moment ago. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God called light into being. God made the sky and dotted it with stars. God created the sea and filled it with animals. God fashioned every living thing. And then Genesis tells us, God rested from all his work, blessed the seventh day, and made it holy. Did you catch that? God rested. Did you also catch that the very first thing called holy and all of creation was not a person? It was not a place. 
who is a day. We live in a culture that praises busyness and shames those who show any kind of, of slowing down. Rest isn't something we put a whole lot of value on these days, although I think there is kind of a renaissance starting to emerge. It's like we're on a never-ending search for fulfillment in our packed schedules and, and lengthy to-do lists. We have lost an essential rhythm, at least many of us have. If you have experienced jet lag at any point, you know how disruptive it is to be thrown out of your rhythm. But we remember how we were created in the image of God. And God intentionally designed and practiced rest. Regardless of how the creation of the universe all unfolded, there's a reason God took a break from the work and made that rest day holy. Because God knew rest mattered. It provided a chance to enjoy creation, to celebrate. Now, what does it mean that God rested? After all that creating, did God fall exhausted into some grand lazy boy chair? Did God take a nap? Did God take a hot bubble bath? Did God kick back in this glorious rocking chair on his heavenly porch and, and was sipping cold, fresh lemonade? I don't, I don't know what it means that God rested. I only know that I can't ignore that in the second verse of the second chapter of the Bible, which is filled with more verses and words than we even know what to do with, it says God rested. God took his foot off the gas pedal and invites humanity, invites us to do the same, giving us a chance to clear our heads and concentrate on what truly matters. Rhythm. A rhythm of grace and blessing, of work and rest. In the busyness of modern life, we have lost the rhythm between work and rest. And it shows. It shows in our faces. It shows in our weary souls. It shows in our attitudes. It shows in our priorities. It shows in our treatment of others, in our treatment of the earth. It shows in the headlines that change every five minutes. In the beginning, though, God established rhythm. And all life requires a rhythm of rest, from the movement of the stars and the planets and the moons to the beating of a human heart. We live within rhythms. There is rhythm in our waking activity and in the body's need for sleep. There is rhythm in the way day dissolves into night and night into morning. There is rhythm to the seasons as the active growth of spring and summer is quieted by the necessary dormancy of fall and winter. There is tidal rhythm between the sea and the land. And our bodies, our hearts, our heart rests after each life-giving beat. The lungs rest between the exhale and the inhale. Rest is happening all around us. This rhythm. And when God rested and then commanded us to rest, God created this sacred rhythm for us to experience the fullness of life. Yet humanity always finds a way to work ourselves into total oblivion. We have always been focused on doing. And we do a lot. We create a lot. We don't just have the divine ability to create out of nothing. Instead, we create, say, a house, or we create a, a piece of art on a wall inside that house, or a work of music that someone plays on the piano in the living room of that house, or we create a story on pages bound between two covers that sit on a bookshelf in the house. We create products and tools and, and all sorts of things to use in our daily lives. My own children create, and they, they put these creations on the fridge or on the wall, and we read them out loud together. We look at them and celebrate their, crea their creations. And they soak it all up because it reminds, men, reminds them that what they have made has value, just as they have value. And this is a noble thing, my friends, for us to 
to speak our own words into creation, to be co-creators, not on an equal level with God, but God still invites us to co-create, to make something from the various forms of dust that is put before us, whether that's metal from a steel meal or wood from a tree or, or food from the earth. It's all forged in our daily experiences. And we are made somehow in the very image of God. A God who every moment bursts out of the little boxes we try to put God in. Bursting forth, if through no other way, then through those Sabbath moments we make, we recognize, we celebrate in this world. You see, Sabbath gives us space to notice what is taking our time. And then to ask the question, is our allocation of time in line with what gives us life? There's a story told of a wagon train on its way from St. Louis to Oregon. Its members were devout Christians, so the whole group observed the rhythm of stopping for the Sabbath day. And winter was quickly approaching, and some among the group began to panic in fear that they wouldn't reach their destination before the heavy snows came. Consequently, several members proposed to the rest of the group that they should quit their practice of stopping for the Sabbath and continue driving onward seven days a week. The proposal triggered a lot of contention in the community. So finally it was decided, it was suggested that the wagon train should split into two groups those who wanted to observe the Sabbath and those who preferred to travel on that day. The proposal was accepted and both groups set out and traveled together until the next Sabbath day when one group continued while the other remained at rest. Well, guess which group got to Oregon first? The ones who kept the Sabbath. The ones who kept the Sabbath reached the destination first. Because both the people and the horses were so rested by their Sabbath observance that they could travel much more vigorously and effectively the other six days of the week. Disrupting our rhythm of work and Sabbath, I believe, has much far reaching, much more far reaching consequences than we realize. Six days a week. Seven days a week for a lot of us, we try to dominate the world. But on the seventh day, we are invited to try to dominate the self and let God work in us and on us. And in a 24-7 society, a world that is always on and always going, how do we work this important rhythm back into our lives? We'll be discovering that over the next weeks months perhaps, or the rest of our lives hopefully, but three simple steps, not easy steps, but three simple steps as a start, pick your day of rest, could be any day, set some boundaries, and put the plan into practice. There is one candle for each of the Sabbath commandments in Torah, both of which call God's people to be more like God. The first commandment is based on this creation account where God calls a day holy. Resting every seventh day, the first, the first Sabbath candle announces, made in God's image, you too shall rest. Sabbath is both a day and an attitude to nurture stillness. It is a day we enter, but just as much it is a way that we see. It is a way that we approach this world and our lives. It is a rhythm. Because Sabbath imparts the rest of God, actual physical, mental, and spiritual rest, and the things of God's nature and presence that we miss in our busyness when we don't let up on the gas pedal. And so, my friends, may the overflowing love of God for your created life invite you 
to cease and desist so that you may truly exist. <laughs>